So we'll discuss some in Yane Chanukah as Chanukah is quickly approaching. There's an interesting Gemara in Shabbos. In fact, that's where we will find the laws of Chanukah will be in Hilchah Shabbos, will be in Mesecha Shabbos. Hilchah is Chanukah, but Mesecha Shabbos. Why in the world would Chanukah be put in the second chapter of Mesecha Shabbos? Because you know it's the name of the second chapter. So if you're Ashkenaz, you'll have a better chance of knowing it because we say this in between, before Mayrev on Friday night. Svarim have a different one, they say. Kegavna or something? Yeah, we, Malikim, we, we do Bameh Malikim, the Minig yeah. Ash. No. Oh, you do it also? Okay, oh, it's yeah. a different Minhag. Yeah. Yeah. But the Minig is we say Bameh Malikim, we do it before um, Mayrev. So that's what the second parak of Shabbos is. The Gemara is talking about all the laws of the appropriate oil and candles for Shabbos lighting. Hence, the Gemara continues right into Chanukah, what are the appropriate oils and wicks for Chanukah, and it's the derech, the way of the Gemara, once it starts off with the wicks, it goes on to all the other issues. So you have about three blot, three, about three pages or so of Gemara on Chanukah. That's about it. Whatever, it's about Chaf Aleph to about Chaf Dalet. You have about three pages of Gemara and Hanukkah. Yet when it comes to Purim, which is a similar holiday, not the same, but it's also a post-biblical holiday, we have a whole Masechta. It's called Masechus Megillah. So, and in fact, the truth be told, that really most of Megillah isn't about Purim. The, some of the first parak, I'd say, you know, most of the first parak is about Purim. It then it contrasts different things, and then it has a lot of agadata on Purim. And then basically, parak two, three, and four deal with the laws of davening, the laws of Kriya Satora, the laws of Beis Nesses. So really, in terms of commentary and shtickle Torahs, there's like more Torah written on Hanukkah than on these three pages than there are on the whole Masechus Megillah, which is limited to Purim. Mm. Not that there's plenty on Purim, but there's a tremendous amount. Mm. And we'll see um, why that was, cause, because interesting as well, you find very little mention of Hanukkah in the Mishnah. Obviously, Purim you find in the Mishnah because you have a Masechta. But you have very little mention of Hanukkah in the Mishnah. What I mean very little is basically no mention of Hanukkah per se. We're not talking about Hanukkah at all in the Mishnah. Hanukkah per se is left out of the Mishnah. What I mean to say is parenthetically Hanukkah is mentioned, i.e. in the Mishnah Megillah, it tells us about, you know what, on Hanukkah, you read the Kriya Torah of, when it goes through Kriya Torah. Or, in Gemara Baba Kama, when it's talking about Nezikin, when it's talking about damages, about if your camel goes out, and it's flax, and he knocks over, and he, the flax catches on fire, who's responsible? But the point is, however, the, the Mishnah says, when if it's if it's Hanukkah, you have to be more careful because you know people are going to be lighting Hanukkah candles outside. Mm. So there's no, so there's no mention of Hanukkah per se in the Mishnah. It's just parenthetical, and the, and the question is why? Why is Hanukkah left out of the Mishnah? You would think um, Hanukkah. So you first, at first glance, you'll say, I know why Hanukkah is left out of the Mishnah. Maybe Hanukkah happened after. Maybe it happened after Rabbi Huda Hanasi did the Mishnayis. But historically speaking, that wouldn't be a good answer. Because historically speaking, the Mishnayis were written a couple hundred years or so before Hanukkah. 
So Hanukkah happened after Hanukkah happened before, and then they wrote the Mishnah. So therefore, that's not why it's left out of the Mishnah. Yes. So there has to be a reason why Rabbi Yehuda Hadassi felt it necessary to leave Hanukkah out of the Mishnayis. In fact, interesting, in the opposite realm, we have a question in the opposite direction on the Rambam. Because the Rambam in Hilchis Hanukkah, which is interesting, he puts Hilchis Hanukkah and Purim together. The first ch- two chapters are Hilchis Megillah, Purim, and then in the beginning of Hanukkah, which is Paragimel, he writes something he normally doesn't do. He writes, he gives us the whole history, and I'll read to you from the Rambam. Uvabayashani, during the time of the second temple, Kishamalche Yovan Gazuk Zerus Al Yisrael, the great kingdom issued decrees against the Jewish people. Ubatludatam, they wanted to nullify their faith and uh, this we do to English, we'll skip to Hebrew, and refused them to observe the Torah and its commandments. They entered the Beis Hamikdash, the sanctuary, and made it tummy, they made it impure. The Jews suffered great difficulties from them, for they oppressed them greatly until Hashem of our ancestors had mercy upon them, delivered them from their hand and saved them. The sons of the Hashmonam, the high priest, overcame them, slew them, and saved the Jews from their hand. They appointed a king from the priest, and sovereignty returned to Eretz Israel for more than 200 years until the destruction of the second temple. So, the Chazra Malchus Israel and the Jewish kingship returned. Yes, there are for over 200 years until the destruction of the second temple. So Hanukkah happened right before, you know, a couple hundred years before the Churban Bayesheni. Rebbe wrote the Mishnayit after, after that. So why is it? It's interesting. On one hand, the Mishnayis leave it out, and the Gemara has a couple of pages on it. And the Rambam, of all people, he resurrects it, so to speak. He starts bringing up Hanukkah. And the question is, the Rambam, as he tells us in his introduction to Mishnah Torah, uh, again, I'll, sum- I'll summarize his introduction. He writes, Kol shel davar, this, to summarize, the intent of this text, meaning his, his Mishnah Torah, what he's writing, is that a person will need, will not need another text at all with regard to any Jewish law. Rather, this text will be your oral law, etc. He goes on. Therefore, I have called this text Mishnah Torah with the intent that a person should first study the written law, the 24 books of Moses, and then study the te- this text and comprehend the entire oral law from it without having to study any other text between the two. So Rama is a very interesting statement in his introduction to Mishnah Torah. He says, for a Jewish library, you only need two books. Well, two books, meaning like the 24 books of Tanakh and the Rambam Mishnah Torah and you said. So, and in fact, not many people liked the way the Rambam said it. I'm not getting into the intent of the Rambam. Maybe he wasn't he didn't realize how it sounded. He's just ex- explaining what he thought. But people think it was a little gaiva, a little haughty for the Rambam to write this. And therefore, the, in the yeshivas, they don't call it the Mishnah Torah. Well, where does the word Mishnah Torah come from? Mishnah Torah is the fifth book, fifth book of Moses. It's called Devarim, Deuteronomy. And that's what it is. We call it the fifth book of Moses. It summarizes the first four books. So the Rambam says, he called his book Mishnah Torah, he's summarizing the whole oral law. So in yeshivas they call it the Yad, Han, Yad, Yud, Dawad, because there are 14 volumes. So therefore they don't like calling it the Mishnah Torah because some felt it was inappropriate. And therefore, 
they call it the Yad. But this parenthetically, there's a beautiful Vilna Gon on last week's parsha, parsha's Vayishlach, that this it says, I'm not saying the Rambam was saying, maybe this is trying in the Rambam why he says this, but it says a Talmud Chacham can have a Shmini of the Shminis, an eighth, like one sixty fourth of Gaiva. Gaiva, I don't want to call it haughtiness, but let's say self confidence. Where is the Gemara, what's the source, the Vilna Gon asks, that the Gemara says that a Talmud Chacham could have a little bit of Gaiva, oh, a Shmini of Shminis, a, an eighth of an eighth. So he says, you know where it comes from? It comes from the Pasuk in Parashas Vayishrach, the eighth Pasuk in Parashas Vayishrach. Vayishrach is, is Parasha number eight from the beginning. The verse number eight is, Katonti mikol hachasidim. God, I don't deserve all of this. In other words, I don't deserve all of this. I deserve a little of it. In other words, Yaakov, from Yaakov Avinu, Showed a little bit of guy. Okay, okay, I deserve a little. So from the villain the Gon says, this is the source where the Gemara says you, you can get a shminis of the shminis. We learn it so um, you know perhaps maybe um, the Rambam didn't feel he was just taking a shminis of a shminis. Maybe that's why the Rambam put it in. But regardless of his motivation, the bottom line is he he makes it clear. Why did he write the Mishnah Torah exclusively? for halachic rulings. You want to understand Torah Shabbat Peh? Come to me. But it's not a history book by no means. So therefore, it's the obvious question in the beginning of Hilchus Hanukkah, he starts giving us a history lesson instead of giving us a halachic lesson. Well, that's the kasha. What is he? So it seems to be the reverse. The Rabbi Yehuda Nasi left, to, left Hanukkah out of the Mishnayis. And it's like the Rambam goes out of its way to tell us what Rebbe left out of the Mishnah. So, I guess, you know, I guess they're two separate questions. They could be connected, they could be not. Why did the Rebbe leave it out of the Mishnah? Why did Rebbe leave Hanukkah out of the Mishnah? Is one question. And why does the Rambam delve into, begin his Mishnah Torah and Hanukkah with the history when he tells us an introduction, I am not a history book, I am uh, a Lachit Sefer. So perhaps we have, so one way to answer it is that we have to come up with a halachic reason to why the Rambam gave us the history. So, I, so apparently we'll have to come up with an answer why the history here was necessary to learn Hilchas Hanukkah. So we'll suggest um, an explanation here. So to, to explain the explanation, we have to go back to some background info. So then we, that takes us to a Gemara Megillah, 14a, Yudalad Amin Aleph. The Gemara discusses a famous question, why do we not recite Hallel on Purim? Why there is no ha- Purim? Is a, you know, Yantif. It's a holiday. Hanukkah. We say Hallel all eight days. In fact, the Rambam goes into Hilchas Hanukkah. He talks about Hallel. It's a day of Hallel Vodda. The essence of Hanukkah is Hallel. So the Gemara asks. You know, usually Hanukkah and Purim are similar. So if you have, so if you have two things which are totally opposite, you don't ask well, how they're different. But when you have two similar things. And then you see differences, and then you ask, it's an interesting question, why does it work for one and not the other? So we don't need anyone else. The Gemara already asked, why is it that Purim, there is no Hallel? Because it didn't take place in Israel. Correct. That's one of three answers the Gemara suggests. So we'll read them right now. So the Gemara tells us, that's the first one the Gemara gives. She'ein omer Hallel al hanesha b'chutzloharetz. We don't say halal on a miracle that happened in Chutzlaret. And since Purim, we know, happened in Persia. Hanukkah happened in the base of Mixed in Eretz Israel. So Hanukkah apparently warrants a bracha, warrants a halal, and Purim does not. 
I, I'll ask you, and it's not me, the Gemara's question is, what about how well we say on Pesach for Yitzias Mitzrayim, for the exodus of Egypt? Last I checked, Egypt's not in the land of Israel. In fact, according to the Rambam, you no longer, well, the Torah has a Pasuk, and depending how you learn, that you can't, you can't even, for it's not so simple whether you can live in Egypt even. But that's a separate discussion. But the Gemara says, so how could we say how well on Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, on the Exodus from Egypt? So the Gemara answers, you're right. It's the old grandfather cause. <laughs> you're right, it's only once Yoshua entered the land of Israel and we acquired it, then that became a prerequisite. But obviously, before we entered the land of Israel, any miracle pre Eretz Israel, so the, the, the miracle happened anywhere, we would say hello. But the b basic answer is, is Purim happened in Chutzlar, it's no hello. Answer number two. Rav Nachman Omar, Kriyasa zu halewa. We do say hallel. Why? But the Gemara just said we don't say hallel. And, we, and even if the Gemara doesn't say it, I'm saying it. I don't say hallel on Purim. So the ice hitter doesn't have it in there. No, we don't, the luck is we don't say hallel. So, so what do you mean we do say hallel? So the Gemara says, Kriyasa zu hallel. No, we do say hallel. But it's, a diff it's not the classical hallel we used to. The how is called Megillus Esther. The Megillus Esther, that's publicizing the miracle. That's our hallow on Purim. That's the second answer is we do say hallow, but it's not the classical hallow. And answer number three, Rava Omer, Bishro Mahasam Pesach, Hallu Avdei Hashem, Velo Avdei Paro. So the Gemara tells us in order to say hallow, we, can't, we have to be Avde Hashem. We have to be servants of the Lord, the low Avde Paro. And that since we went free, we were no longer slaves of Paro. So therefore, we were able to say Hal on Pesach. But by Purim, the Gemara says, Akate Avde Achashverosh Anon. We were still under, it's true. We were saved from Haman's decree of killing us, but the bottom line is we were still under the finger, under the domain of Achashverosh. And hence, you only can say Hallel when you're in the state of Avde Hashem. But since we are Avde Achashverosh, hence we can't say Hallel on Purim. So, so we see three answers why we don't say Hallel. Either because it happened in Chutzlaret, Purim, we do say Hallel, but we read the Megillah that is the Hallel, or we don't say Hallel because we're in their foreign domination. Right. So therefore, so according to answer number three, we're saying is it's not a day warranting the Hallel because we didn't have our own dominion. So that perhaps, based on this third reason, maybe we can understand why the Rambam gave, felt compelled in his halacha sefer, halacha sefer of Mishnah Torah, why the Rambam felt compelled to give me the history. Because, and he also, the Rambam goes right into Hilchus Hallel after that. So what is the Rambam, t what is Rambam emphasizing? What's the Russian Rambam? Let me go back. and they appointed a king from the priest and sovereignty returned to Israel for more than 200 years on the destruction of the second temple. They were no longer Avadim to Syrian to Greeks. The Rambam's not giving me a history lesson. He might be parenthetically. That's not what he's telling us. We were free. We weren't abundant to any external body, to any other political party. The Chashmonon took over. It was Jewish control over Eretz Israel, and he calls it a Yeshua. When Jews, when Jews get to run the land of Israel. 
And that's perhaps why the Rambam gave us the history. The history, because you ask, how can we say how? Well, we don't say how on Purim. Akate Avda Chashverosh Anan. Maybe we had the same problem on Hanukkah. Because so the Rambam goes out of its way to say, no, we took over the kingship for more than 200 years. And hence, since we took over the kingship, we get to say how on Hanukkah. We, we don't have the problem. We, we could say we're Avde Hashem and we are free to say how well. That's how someone has suggest. That's why the Rambam gives us a history lesson about, um, about um, Hanukkah before he tells us the halacha. So we might ask a question on the Rambam from independent point. Cause, so this answer fits in quite well. The problem with this answer is, if you look at the Rambam himself in Hilchus Megillah and Hilchus Purim, when he tells you, why don't we say Halal on Purim, it'd be great if he gave the third answer, the three answers in the Gemara. But he writes in Halach Avav, he gives the second answer. Kriyasa zu Halela. The reason is because Megillah's Esther takes the place of Halal. So, he would seem to reject the region of Akate Ada Khajverajanan. Yes, so one you could answer is maybe who says are they are they mutually exclusive to hold both? Um, kind of, because why do I think they're mutually exclusive? I wouldn't say they're mutually I wouldn't say hundred percent they're mutually exclusive, but I'll say why it's difficult that you could hold both reasons because they're fundamentally different. In other words, answer number two is basically saying that Purim's a day which warrants a Hallel. And we are saying how we're doing the Megillus Esther. Saying Akate Avde Akate Avde Achashverosh on you saying it's not a day that warrants a Hallel. So I seem to think that then it's hard to say you can work with both of them. So therefore we have to come up with another reason. So what's the why is the Rambam if, if we're going to work with our pshat, and the reason why he goes into the history of Hal and Hanukkah is to teach me that we had Jewish control, and hence we could say Hallel, how do we deal with the Rambam who gives the reason of Kriyasa Zu Halela that Megillus Esther takes the place? So perhaps we could defend the Rambam based on the following. There's an interesting, interesting question the Me'iri raises, one of the earlier commentators who we found his manuscripts much later on. He says, what's the difference, let's say, between these answers? He has, he has the following question. What happens if you live in a town that doesn't have a Megillah? Or wherever you are, you're stuck, you're on a road trip, make up your own hypothetical. It's Purim day, you don't have a Megillah, a Megillah is Esther. And I'm davening now. Should I say Hallel on Purim or not? So I was according to answers one and three, no. According to answer number two, you should say it. Mm. Well, if you, if you take, that is if you take it to the logical, if you take it to the logical um, conclusion. So that's the fact that the, that's what the Me'iri raises. That he raises this point that if you don't have a Megillah, you should say Hallel, which makes sense. The problem is the Me'iri points out, well, Halacha, we reject this. That we don't. That if we're stuck in a town without no Megillah, we don't read Hallel. Also, maybe because either you could say, well, we don't pass them like the Rambam and we accept one and two. Let's assume we accept reason number two, like the Rambam. So even the Rambam wouldn't say, the question is why wouldn't the Rambam agree, or why wouldn't, it's a very logical reason the Me'iri. According, if you, if you hold Kriyat Zu Halela, if you don't have a Megillah, you should read the Halel on Purim. So, the, so therefore the Mepharshim suggests as follows, that... I mean, the Rambam doesn't actually say that the Megillah is Hallel, he says I mean, it's the equivalent of that. Right, well, he so quotes the, the no, he quotes the Gemara. The Gemara says, Kriyasa, meaning the reading, the reading of, of is Hallel. I mean, that, 
Zuhal. The Gemara's question was, why don't we see Hallel? Mm. The answer is we are saying Hallel, but we're doing, but the Megillah, it's not the standard text of the Hallel, it's a different type of Hallel. So, but yeah, in a way, he's also saying, this is the text of Hallel you should be saying. Exactly, very good. That's, the, that's what we're going to answer, very good. So, apparently, there are different types of Hallel. Because apparently we see, why do we have a different standard of Hallel on Purim? So apparently what the Ramam is suggesting, or what the post that obviously the Megillah, the Hallel of Megillah's Esther is a totally different Hallel than the classical Hallel HaMitri we normally say. So what way is it different? Because as we know, that Purim, with the different types of miracles we have in life, there is miracles which break the laws of nature, open, clear-cut miracles, and then we have Nes Nister, hidden miracles, miracles within Teva, work within, um, and, it's, and it's the Ramban, Nechmanides and Parshas Bo writes, really, there's no difference to God. Everything's a Nes. But for our purposes, anything that breaks the laws of nature, something that normally doesn't happen, we call a miracle. But anything that happens all the time, we, we call nature. But really, even nature is a miracle. And he gives an example. When the Jews went into Eretz Israel, and Yeshua said, you know what? You got to start working for a living. You got to plant a tree. You got to start planting seeds. What? You mean food's going to grow out of the ground? That's amazing. You mean a tree is going to grow? What a nace. But, oh, but of course food comes from heaven. That was a given to them. So obviously today is the opposite. If we had food man from heaven, we couldn't sit it. So again, so it's just a matter of what we used to. And in fact, the, the Bali Musa point out even the opposite, that really having a child is a bigger miracle than Trias HaMesim, then resurrection of the dead. But try, if you're an editor of a newspaper, let's say someone put on the front page, breaking news, baby born. He'd be fired the next day because, you know, no one, he's not going to be selling any papers. But if he wrote, wow, resurrection of the dead happened, he'd sell out. So the Bali Musa say it's a bigger miracle for a baby being born because by Trias HaMesim, the body's there, you're just resurrecting it. Here, you're creating from a Tipa Sucha, so it's just what we used to. And in fact, there's a... So, so that's what they point, so we know the difference, so Purim, so what's the difference between, let's say, Purim and Pesach and Hanukkah, but Purim, Megillus S is the only book in Tanakh that doesn't have God's name in it because that was a miracle behind the scenes. It looked like one big coincidence after another. This happened, I couldn't fall asleep, I read the book of Chronicles, and, and then one thing led to another, Haman walked in, Esther, in other words, you read a one continuation. Obviously, you have to read in between the lines to appreciate it. Like this one in the, one in the um, Rebbeim, I guess when they were running away during the war, and they were stuck in Russia. So the rabbi, the rebbe, asked one of his students, get me, go buy me a newspaper, a Russian newspaper. So the student was taken aback, like, but rebbe, you don't read Russian. So the rebbe said, yeah, but it's reading in between the lines. <laughs> that's, the, that's the key, seeing God behind the scenes. That's what Purim's all about. That's a miracle was in Derech HaTeva. But Chanukah, the miracle of the oil, was Mimalami Derech HaTev, or Pesach, Kriyas Yamsif, those are all supernatural miracles. So that's the pshat, that the Ramam, uh, when he was talking about not saying Halal and Purim, that he was telling us that there's only, the regular Halal isn't appropriate on Purim. Because that's a Halal on God, you break the laws of nature. But, so therefore the question we're answering is, why if the Rambam, if, why do we paskin that if we say that Kriyas and Megillah takes the place of Hallel, so if we don't have a Megillah, how come we don't say Hallel? The answer is the two types of Hallel. 
The classic hawa is inappropriate on Purim. It's only the Kriya Sazu Halewa Hawel. And that's why the Ramam felt it was necessary, it wasn't necessary to say, Akate Ave Achajverish Anon, but this is only relevant to the, when you're talking about the regular Hawel, then Avde Hashem, that's relevant. But when, but in Hilchitz Purim, he was just discussing another Nakuda, the reason why um, um, we don't say Hawel on Purim, it's a totally different type of Hawel, and that's why it's not a question. So that's one reason we have why the Ramam goes through the history, history of it. And in fact, it's interesting, as we said, that both, um, the both, how um, Hanukkah and Purim are both post-biblical holidays. So they both come with problems, which they're not problems anymore. We already worked out, but the issue of, there's a prohibition of the Torah called Baal Tosef, adding to the Torah. Like, if on a tefillin, we can't put five parshas, five portions, or on Lua, we can't put five species. That's Baal, that's adding, that's Baal Tosef. So there's also a problem of adding a new holiday. So the Gemara and Megillah wrestles with how can they institute the holiday of Hanukkah? And the, how can they institute the holiday of Purim? So they, they discuss it with Purim and Hanukkah over there. The bottom line is they work it out. That was okay, they got permission, and it was okay to be Koveya, a new Yantif. It was relevant to the discussion can we make new Yom Tovim today? But it's worked out. So since Hanukkah and Purim, so number one is, Rav Salvation points out, because the Rambam switches around, and in, in the Rambam, when he writes the Mishnah Torah, he talks about Hilchas Purim first, and then Hilchas Hanukkah. Yet we know on the calendar, it happens the reverse. We know from Rosh Hashanah, first comes Hanukkah, if you open up a Shulchan Arach, it goes with the, cal- with the calendar. Hanukkah, but, then Purim. But there are two ways of looking at the calendar. You can start with uh, Pesach. Messiah, yeah. yeah, but either way, Purim is before Pesach. Right. It is two ways, but it doesn't help <laughs> us in this case. But. But so the question is, why does the Rambam switch around the order? So obviously the answer is because the two totally different functions. Shulchan Aruch is telling you how to act. He's taking you through the day. Where if Salvation points out, that's what the Rambam told us, the Mishnah Torah is the, is the essence of the Torah Shabbat Peh. And therefore, what the Rambam is telling us, Hanukkah was only possible, conceptually speaking, if you have a Purim first. The rabbis had to work out, the Nevi'im had to work out that it was okay for Esther and Mordechai to institute Purim. Once they entered a new holiday, they had to go through a... Pro- now that, that paved the way. So therefore, when the Rambam is, is teaching us in the Torah Shabbat Peh, he's teaching us the conception that there could be... there can't be a Hanukkah without a Purim. It's only because it was a Purim first and we got permission to be Koveya new Yantav with the appropriate um, conditions so too Hanukkah is possible. So since both are post-biblical, we know there's a concern about Tosef, that people say, hey, you're adding to the Torah. Mm-hmm. As the Rambam writes, he has a Chiddush, but the Rambam writes, that not only is it, not only is it about Tosef to put on a fifth parasha to its fill-in, or a fifth species to Yilulav, but to, to claim a rabbinic law is a biblical law, that's about Tosef, in other words, if the rabbis would say eating chicken and milk is a biblical prohibition, that's Baal Tosef. That's right. They have to know it's only a rabbinical. So, so based on this, the Mepharshim point out, this could explain why we have unique practices on both day of Purim and Hanukkah. On Purim we have a unique practice that we usually know it's Torah Achasi. It's one Torah for everybody. So why is it that it's the only yuntiv where, depending where you live, you celebrate on a different day? Or be most of the world celebrates on the 14th, but in the walled city from the time of Yeshua ben Nun, Yushalayim, you celebrate on the 15th. Why do something different here? 
So the Bear Yosef explains of Yosef Salant is because since Purim is a rabbinical holiday, we didn't want people confusing it and thinking it's a biblical holiday. So we had to go out of our way and make it clear. How do we make it clear? By doing something different. By, and you'll say, oh, it must be different because we're celebrating on different days. Where do we find that distinction in Hanukkah? Hanukkah is the same. Same eight days in Israel, same eight days everywhere. So the Be'er Yosef explains we have another halacha. It's called... It's called lighting Hanukkah candles. It's called, how do we light Hanukkah candles? So there's one level, is one candle per household. Near echad So that's the minimum obligation. If you lit one candle every night of Hanukkah, we can't take the mitzvah away from you. The next level, mahajan, is to light, if you have four members in your household, so every day you light four candles. If you have 20 in your household, you light 20, which interesting would say that really the concept of a menorah was a later institution, having like a candle, because obviously if you had 20 people in your home, you basically had a collection of candles, not a menorah. That's a separate discussion. And the third level is mahajim and mahadrin. So we have a third, what is this? And we don't have this. So that's the whole discussion. So the bottom line we is we add another candle every night. That's what we do. One the first night. We don't find this by any other mitzvah, mahajim and mahadrin. We find it on our cheese, on our salamis, but we don't find it by any other mitzvah. <laughs> so what's mahajim and mahadrin? So the Be'er Yosef, because the rabbis had to go out of their way to make the mitzvah. You since it's a rabbinical mitzvah, we don't want you to confuse it with the biblical mitzvah. So therefore, we might, when it came to Purim and it came to Hanukkah, we had to go out of our way to make sure it's clear that you know it's only a rabbinical holiday. And that's why to avoid the problem about Tosef, so that's why um, we had to go into, you know, it could be then the Rabbim's telling us it's only a rabbinical holiday, Bayusheni, etc. And just to conclude, I'll give a whole share on another time why is it left out of the Mishnayis, but at least I'll give you one answer for now. Why was Hanukkah? So the Rambam re brought it back alive, but why did Rebbe, why did Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi leave it out of the Mishnah? So he left it out of the Mishnayis because according to the Rambam and Peirush HaMishnayis, is you got to out of the, the Mishnahis because the Rambam, again, this is a global answer, it's not just limited to Hanukkah, but Talas and Tfilin, you don't find in the Mishnahis either. How come? So the Rambam, the page of the because anything that was well known, that was a daily occurrence, everyone knew about Talas and Tfilin, you wear it every day. Everyone knew about Hanukkah, it was a common occurrence, so therefore um, it was so popular so that there was no need for Rebbe to put it in the Mishnayas. We'll see. There are other reasons almost saying the opposite. That it was a, Some want to say that the Rambam had to publicize it because people were forgetting about Hanukkah. But, or some want to point out, historically speaking, that it was a time right after the Bar Kokhba rebellion and Tefillin, Talis, Hanukkah are all nationalistic mitzvahs. And Hanukkah, the small against the many, you can think we're making another revolt. So there are, so there are some historical reasons and we'll continue another time we'll, over the next week or two giving you, I have about four or five different reasons in the Mepharshim. Why did Rebbe leave Hanukkah out the Mishnaya? So maybe maybe we next week's discussion. I'm going to be here next week. The Gemara tells us in Shabbos, on the Avchav Aleph Amin Beis, tells us about the mitzvah of Hadulachas Neiros on Hanukkah. One of the mitzvahs of the day is lighting Hanukkah candles, as well as Bahalo Bahodah. As we all know also, there's a mitzvah saying Halo every day of Hanukkah. That's where the Raman puts down all the, the laws of Halo. So we'll discuss a little bit about the nature of the mitzvah. So the Gemara in Shabbos tells us there's something unique about Hanukkah. 
different than all other mitzvahs that we find at the three tiered level, or what we'll see. So the Gemara says the first level is ner ish ubeso. The minimum requirement is one candle per household. So if you, so obviously if someone comes to me before and says how many candles should I light, I'll tell them the appropriate number. But if someone comes to me and says, you, you know what, I lit one candle last night, I'll say you have fulfilled your mitzvah of near Hanukkah. That is your minimum obligation every night of Hanukkah, one candle per night. Then the Gemara says the second level is umahadrin. Those who run after mitzvahs, who are more careful, meticulous, they go by how many members in your household. So if you have 10 members in your household, so every night of Hanukkah, you light 10 candles. So level number one is one candle every night of Hanukkah. This level number two, Mahadrin, is 10 candles every night of Hanukkah. This parenthetically, if that's true, then we, we never really had the concept of a menorah because it's just a bunch of candles because every house would be different. Might, you might, some might have 15 members, some might have four. But, so the third level seems to be, a, a third level is a Mahlokin space hill of Boshamai. Mahajim and a Mahadrin. What's the third level? So Beishamai says you light eight candles the first night and you go from eight to one. And Beis Hillel says one to eight. And the Gemara gives different reasons for their opinions. One opinion is you go by what day of Hanukkah it is now. So then I light one candle, tomorrow two. If I say how many days of Hanukkah are left, so the first day there's eight, seven. Or the Gemara gives another reason. The Gemara says, Beis says, You always go up in sanctity, you don't go down. And Beis Hillel says, On Sukkot, that on the Yom Tovim, you go down from 13 sacrifices, 12, 11, so you go down every day. So why is Beis Shammai pattern it after Sukkot? So interesting, the Mepharshim point out that Every rabbinic holiday is patterned after a biblical one. So Purim, let's say one day, Purim is the time of Man Torah, so that's patterned after Shavuos, which is one day in our Torah. Chanukah, eight days, what other yantil do we have? Eight days, Sukkot. So it's patterned after Sukkot, and also there are other similarities. Near Chanukah, you lie outside, or you did anyway. Sukkah, you sit outside. There's halacha, the Sukkah can't be more than 20 amas high because it says the person is supposed to look at the schach and remember the mitzvah. So to near Hanukkah, it's supposed to publicize the miracle. If people can't see it, you're not going mm-hmm. There are many similarities between Sukkot and Hanukkah. So that's, so that's the opinion, Machokis Beis Hillel Beis Shammai. As you must figure out by now, we pass them like Beis Hillel, and we lie one, one through eight. So within the Machokis, Beis Hillel, Beis Shammai, so let's take Beis Hillel. So what does Mahajim and Mahajim mean? So let's say you have 10 members in your household and it's the eighth night of Hanukkah. How many candles? So the Rambam learns is the third level. 10 times 80 go 80. If, if Nerish Beis means one candle every night, Mahajim means you go according to the number of, you go according to the number of people in your household. So then, that's the second level, that's 10. But, so the Rambam says, Mahajan Hajj is the third level. You do 10 times 8, you go 80. So according to the Rambam, on the last night of Hanukkah, you have 80 candles in your house. That's the way the Rambam learns. Tosvas learns, it's going back on, on the area Shubeso. It's going back on the beginning. In other words, so he says, what is Tosa say Mahajan and Mahajan is? You have one the first night, two the second, three, no matter how many members, members of your family is irrelevant to Mahajan Mahajan. You're like, one, so that's the, so Mahokas Tosa in the Rambam is, what is Mahajan and Mahajan according to Beis Hillel? If you have 10, if you have 10 members, if you only have one member in your home, there's no Mahokas. We have 10 members, 
So the Rambam says you write 80 candles, and Tosa says you write 8 candles. Interesting, usually the Svaradim pass them like the Rambam, and the Ashkenaz follow the Bali Tosa. This is one of the exceptions to the rule, where Svaradim go, again, within Svaradim you have different Minhagim, but to some Svaradim there's like one candle, one menorah in the whole house, like Tosa's. And we follow the Rambam of everyone lights their own menorah, so if you have 10 people lighting, you can have 80 candles. So what does Tosa say? Why is that Mahajim and Mahajin? Because that's Yotir Hekera. Tosa's focus on, it's recognizable. If you walk by, you see 80 candles. What is it, the 80th night of Hanukkah? Like, what, what am I supposed to get from that? But they have a Tosa saying, one, the first two, it's clear. Mm -hmm. what night of Hanukkah is. So that's how um, some point out. It depends on the two reasons of the Gemara. If you say it goes by Kenegi Yomim Hayotin on the Knesset, it's key to know what day it is. So Tosis takes that reason. And the Rambam takes another you know, reason of Malad Makodesh Vehimoridin. It's not a mitzvah of pursuing Isa to know it's the sixth day of Hanukkah or the eighth. The point is you should know it's Hanukkah. So the more candles a person sees, the more they'll remember it's Hanukkah. So that's the Machokis in the Gemara, and the Machokis, Rambam and Tosfus, whether Bahajim and Ahadrin is one menorah per household, mm -hmm. or like B'nai Ashkenaz, everyone likes their own menorah. So they point out that actually the Rambam isn't exactly like the Ramah. The Ramah, B'nai Ashkenaz, there's a little distinction between the two. If you look, what our cup minig is, everyone who is going to light, they light their own menorah. The Rambam writes, the Baal Habayis, the Baal Abbas, he lights all 80. In other words, you get the numbers 10 times a day, but the Baal Habayis lights all 80. Mm -hmm. So what's that all about? What forced the Rambam to say, that the Baal Abayis has to light all 80. Like, why can't everyone do what light their own? There's a famous briska rub on this. We have to go to a Gemara in Shabbos, in the 19th parak dealing with Brit's Mila. So Gemara talks about the concept of, by a Brit's Mila, it's what the Gemara calls Sitzin Hama'akvin and Sitzin She'ena Ma'akvin. That there's CERN without getting into graphic details, not that I know them anyway, but without getting into them, there's certain parts of the foreskin that must be cut, and if it's not cut, you didn't do the mila. Mm -hmm. That sits in hamakvin, it's an obstacle in performing the mitzvah. And then there's sits in she'ena ma'akvin. We want you to do it, but it's part of the mitzvah of Zekeli Lanveo. It's part of the Hidder mitzvah that should look nice. So. So the Gemara says, so obviously, if you, if you realize, you finish and you realize you didn't do the Tzitzit HaMa'akvin, okay, so you haven't done anything, so you've got to go back and do the Bris Mila. But let's say you, when you realize you did the Tzitzit HaMa'akvin, but you didn't do the Tzitzit Shein HaMa'akvin. So the Gemara says, if you're still involved in the Bris, then just finish the job. If you pay rest, you've already stopped, so then that's it, you don't go back. So exactly, what does it mean you're still involved? Does it mean you're eating the bagel and lox at the bris? At what point is considered finishing? But whatever it means is, the Gemara says, you go back for the sitzin, she'in amakwit, but if, once you stop, that's it. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why, don't we t why, wouldn't, why can't you go back? Mm -hmm. like, what's the difference if you stop? So I, I'll have my bagel and laugh, and let's go back and finish the job. Like, what's the problem? So this is a major machlokis, Rashi in the tour. So some Rishonim learn, we're talking about Shabbos. So I understand that. Words, this whole halacha, which it's Gemara Shabbos, it's Hilchus Mila. Only on Shabbos we're talking about, because you can't go, apparently, you say, for, to, for to fulfill the mitzvah Mila and Shabbos, we know the Gemara tells us, the Torah tells us, Yom HaShmini Yimo Basara Vaso. Even though by other mitzvahs, when Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, or Sukkot falls out on Shabbos, we would say no, no love, 
we say no shofar, but Mila is Docha Shabbos, either because Mila is a mitzvah sheyesh bo kareis, and we don't want to take any chances, or as the Taz writes, it's something which is mafurish Bekra. Since the Torah says, Yom HaShemini, Yom HaShemini, Yom HaShemini, the rabbis can't tell you not to do it. So whatever the reason, that's a given, we do the Mila on Shabbos. So that's only for the Tzitz and Amaak. So if you're involved in the Mila, so it's all part of the same job. You can cut off both the Tzitz and Amaak bin and the Tzitz and Shein Amaak bin. But if Perish, you finish the bris, and now you can't, and you, an hour later you remember, so if it's Shabbos, I understand. So maybe you can't be Machal Shabbos for the Tzitz and Shein Amaak bin. So I understand, I believe it's Rashi Shita. If it's, if it's talking about Shabbos, then I understand the Gemara. But the other Rishonim say, Afilu Bechol. And that seems to be the Rambam Shita. The Rambam warns, even during the week, even on Tuesday, if this happens, you better make sure you get a good Moel, according to the Rambam, because that's it, you can't go back. You got to do it right the first time. So the Rambam writes, even during the week, the question is, what's the shot on the Rambam? Mm -hmm. So some want to say, maybe because it's considered, so really, it's a chiddish that we can do mila at all. Normally, there's a biblical prohibition, you can't cause damage to yourself. So, if it wasn't for the midst of mila, I wouldn't be able to do it. I can't just go ahead and start pricking myself any parts of my, there's a midst of mila, so that makes it necessary. But, now that it's only, you already finished the midst of mila, so therefore maybe it's not considered enough of a hetero now to go ahead and cause more harm. However, the Briska Rav wants to say as follows. He wants to say the Rambam here is Lishitas. And what is, what, is, what is the question at hand? The Briska Rav says, we know what is left. Why, why do you have to do the Sitz and Shein Ma'akvin? It's part of Hidr Mitzvah, Zek Keli Van Veo. So the question the Briska Rav raises, Yesh Lachkor, is this Hidr Mitzvah only make sense in the context of the Maisa Mitzvah. In other words, when I'm involved in the Mitzvah, then the Hidr makes sense. But, but it doesn't make sense in a vacuum. I can't just go ahead and hit the Mitzvah independently to go back an hour later and just to do, what am I doing? If I'm not doing Mila, I can't do it. He says, that's the, that's just the raising the question. Do I, do I say it must be part and parcel of the Maisa Mitzvah? Or no. Hit the Mitzvah, I can do any time. It it's preferable to do it right away, so he says he wants this, this is the machokas. He says the Rambam Shita is that you can't separate the hinder from the Maisa Mitzvah. And that's the Pshat is Eino Choser, it's not meaningful. You can't do a hinder mitzvah in a vacuum. And that's why you, it has to be in order to do a hinder mitzvah, it has to be in the context of the Maisa Mitzvah. Mm -hmm. But and that's the Rambam Shita. And that's why even Bakhol you can't go back. So with this the Briskarov says it's the Rambam with Shittas, and we, yeah, we said, we have a Machloka, it's the Rambam and the Ramah. We said we all agree on 80 candles. Mm -hmm. The issue is, who lights them? So the Ra Ramah says, we know each person lights their own. The Rambam writes, the Bali's going to be busy every night of Pesach. He's going to be lighting, or at least on the eighth night, he's going to be lighting 80 candles. Mm -hmm. So what's the Pshat? The Pshat is, what do we say? What is the Iker Mitzvah near Hanukkah? one candle every night. So once you lit the first candle, the mitzvah is over. What am I doing? I'm just doing a Hidra mitzvah. So what's the Rambam Shita? Hidra mitzvah only makes sense if you're connected to the Maisa mitzvah. So whoever did the first candle has to do the other 79. But the Ramah holds, no. Hidra mitzvah makes sense by itself. And therefore each person could go ahead and light their own candles even though the mitzvah has been fulfilled. Or that's what the Briska Rav says. One can argue with the Briska Rav and say, you see, the Briska Rav is assuming, according to the Ramah, if you have ten different people lighting eight candles, I'm, everyone from second and on is only doing Hindu Mitzvah. Maybe, maybe it's not true. Maybe I don't have the mind to fulfill my Mitzvah with the first person, and then, but that gets into a separate issue. So, but that's what he points out. Or, um, however, perhaps you could say it's a different issue, because... Maybe, maybe the issue is what is the nature of the mitzvah of Ne'er Hanukkah? Is what they call in yeshivas, is it a chobet habayis? Is it an obligation on the house like mezuzah? Obviously, 
that the house and it's right Jewish home is obligated to put candles it's a, basically it's a din that's not a personal mitzvah I mean, it's a din in the that's why obviously you don't have a home you're not going to light Hanukkah candles so that's the question why not is it because you're not obligated like an honey if you don't if you're homeless you have no everyone agrees there's no mitzvah mezuzah but you need a home <laughs> so if you don't have a home the question is what about near Hanukkah so obviously if you don't have a home you're not going to light the question is are you not lighting because you don't have an obligation? Or, no, really, I have to light. I'm just honest, I can't help it. I have nowhere to light. So, so, so it's, is it a Chovetz Abayit or it's fundamentally a Chovetz Agavra? So, so what someone explained is, that's the Pshat the Rambam holds, that what it's a Chovetz Abayit, it's a Mitzvah on the bias. And therefore, once the one person, you know, once you light the first candle, so therefore, the whole house, you know, you yod say already, everything else is hider. But the Ramah holds the Chovah Zagavra, so therefore every person perhaps has, you know, has to light their own. The Minig is, again, the Minig, the Minig Ashkenaz would be light our own and with a bracha. So the question is, the fact that we make a bracha, does that mean, is this a proof that you can make a bracha on a hider mitzvah? Which itself is a question, so it's not necessarily a proof because you could say, I'm, I'm not doing a hider mitzvah, I'm doing, you know, I'm doing my own personal obligation. But that itself is a question, but to hit the mitzvah makes sense in a vacuum, or, or not. In fact, along these lines, whether it's a Chobah Sabayis or Chobah Sagavra, there's an interesting this split in the Machaber, I believe, that the Machaber says, by Purim, a katan can't read the Megillah, but by Hanukkah, he quotes the Yesh Omrim that a that a cut and can light near Hanukkah. You know, we pass and we want a brother to do it. But what's chat that what's the what's the chat in the Lumdis? What that a cut and could be we could be yoti with a cut and to the Chacham Sri right? Because by Purim it's a Chovah Sagav, you have to hear the Megillah. And you can't have a cut and um yoti. But here it's a Chovah Zabaya, so therefore you can entertain as long as you know you have a you have a candle with the RCF, or perhaps it's good. But that's um, but that's um, how someone will explain the Machlokas. Um, basil. So let's just summarize so far. We had the different levels of obligation of Ner Hanukkah. The minimum of obligation is Ner Ishu Beso. The second level is Mahadrin. You go by the members of your 10 people in your house, 10 every day. Mahadrin and Mahadrin. So that's uh, either 80 down to 10 by 10 to 80, depending if you go with Beis Hillel or Beis Shammai. Then within that, we, within Beis Hillel, we had a Machlok, Tosis in the Rambam, what does Mahajim and Mahajim mean? According to Rambam, it means 80, 10 times 8. According to Tosis, no. It means, it goes back on the first level, and it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 8. And Ashkenaz seem to follow the Rambam in this case, and some Svartim follow Tosis. So, within the Minig of the of Mahajan Mahajan, the Rama writes the Balabayas has to light all 80. That's not our minute, we light our own. What's the plan in the Rambam? So the Briska Rav says it's Kushi Tasa based on the Gemara in Shabbos about Sitsudam Ma'akvin, Sitsudjana Ma'akvin, the question of whether, um, why can't you go back if you already finished the Mila but you didn't, but you left over the Sitsudjana Ma'akvin. So Rashi writes because it's Shabbos. So okay, but during the week, of course, you go back. The Rambam warns, no, even during the week you don't go back. Why in the world don't you go back? That's what the Briskara says. That's the Nakuda. Does hit the Mitzvah make sense in, in a vacuum or only connected to the Maisa Mitzvah? The Rambam holds only connected to a Maisa Mitzvah. So as long as you're doing the Mila, it makes sense to do Sitzvah in Jena Ma'akram. If not, you're not gaining anything. Mm -hmm. And the other sheet says, no, even in a vacuum it makes sense. And it's the Rambam consistent with his view by Nir Hanukkah. That's how the Balabai says to lie all 80. Because the one who's doing the first candle, he gets the mitzvah, everything else is hidder, and therefore the, the Baalabai says it all. We assume, though, that um, the hidder mitzvah, either the way he's saying, the Ramah holds hidder mitzvah makes sense by itself, or we say, no, number one is maybe every person is writing their own, or there's another way of explaining it. You know, the Chobah Sabayis, you know, and therefore, once you get the first candle, therefore, that's it, and then the rest. The, the rest could be extra, but if it's a Chovah each person 
in the house um, is, is obligated. And that's how Hanukkah is different because, as we explain, that that's one of the, one of the, as Chazal tell us, one of the things that the Greeks attacked was they attacked the bias. In other words, in different, in contrast to Purim, Purim was Vahash Bidu Purim, they were out to kill us. And they didn't care. It's what we call, it was, um, it was ethnic cleansing, as they call it. Basically, two types of anti-Semitism. But I'll just use to borrow the phrase is religious anti-Semitism and let's say um, you know ethnic or ethnic anti-Semitism in other words that, that Haman he was just interested in killing us he didn't care about you he didn't care if you believed in God or not <laughs> Hitler didn't care if you believed in God he cared if you were Jewish or not if you were Jewish you're dead I don't care what you believe in it didn't make a difference and religious anti-Semitism is more, even though that, they're both absurd logically, but at, but at least religious anti-Semitism is kind of like a competition. My religion is better than yours, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to convert you. But as Rabbi Yonis and Eifshit said to one of the priests who tried to, wanted to get him to convert, he said, you know what, um, you know, yeah, I'll give you, um, I, you know, I'll, you know, I'll give you a prize to Sunday if you convert. So he said to me, he said, my father taught me that if I have a horse and you have a horse and you give me a hundred dollars with your horse, that means my horse is better. Because you have to give me to eat. So the whole thing is, it, it, it doesn't, you're admitting my religion is better. The whole thing doesn't, isn't logically points out. So the point being, there's two types of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what Yaakov said he was praying when he was, when Esav is coming, save me from the hands of my brother, save me from the hands of Esav. We all know Esav and Yaakov are brothers. What's the double language? Mm -hmm. So that's what the Beis HaLevi explains, the two types of anti-Semitism. One is they come as your brother, and the other is they come as Esav with the sword. And that's what the Mepharshim point out. Those are the two young men told them of Hanak and Hallel represent. That Halel, that Purim represents the the Biyad Esav, the physical. They want to physically kill us. But Chanukah, perhaps a more dangerous one, as it says Biyad Achi first. They want us to come as our brothers. No, we don't want you dead. We just want you to accept the Greek culture. We want you to accept our religion. And that's what we do. And we like to. So it was a whole fight against the bias, also against the Jewish, the uniqueness of being a Jew. They attack Shabbos which is uniquely Jewish. They attack um, Kiddush HaChodesh, Rosh Chodesh, because we, got, we have a lunar calendar, and they attack Milo, which is a physical distinction. They want to say, we're all the same, just accept the Greek culture. And, they, and therefore, the attack was against the body, the Jewish home. Therefore, the mitzvah was set up with the mitzvah on the Chobetz HaBayis. We want you to be, and just to conclude, there's a beautiful, um, I think it's a, uh, not or not or Samea. It's in the one in the Chasidish Svarim. This Svat Emes, I believe, he writes. Will conclude is we know this Bana Gemara. The original mitzvah was to light outside your house. You know, outside. But Bana Zeh, we light inside. What's the pshat? Why? What's changed? So he says, Apidrush. He says it used to be the Jewish home was insulated. It was strong. You had you, you lived in ghettos, you know they didn't even, they didn't let you mingle with society. There was pogroms, the anti-Semites. So basically, the Jewish home was strong, and you put the Hanukkah candle, the Or Torah, on your outside of your door to protect you from to keep the outside influences out of your home. Today we all know we have we have TV, internet, and everything else today. Newspapers, the the foreign influence is already in our house. So we have to bring the Torah or we got to bring the near Hanukkah, bring it into our house to, to make sure to keep the foreign influences away from our home, out of our house. Mm -hmm. And that's the distinction. That's why the Swashamist points out, that's why the, the move came from outside uh, to the inside.